Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Alcohol, violence, and pride. Tonight we begin our journey into the lives of Liberty City's most notorious Irish Mafia family, the McCreary's, with our deep dive into the last noteworthy head of the organization and the middle child of five. We will see a boy raised by abuse and violence become a man who would continue that perpetual cycle, and the many dangerous and occasionally deadly decisions he would make which landed many of his friends in the ground and himself behind bars. We will witness the legacy of America's flirtation with Irish discrimination in the early 20th century, one of the country's most audacious bank robberies, and a kidnapping plot gone wrong that ultimately left everyone empty-handed, as we follow the life and times of Gerald McCreary. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks, many of which are extended versions of the tracks that are on streaming services. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Die Castinator, Chuck K45, Miles Garrett, and King GTA 15. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I truly can't express my gratitude for fully. Thank you so much. Today's episode is sponsored in part by my executive producers Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99, where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come soon. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment and fixing it up and then starting a new farm from scratch. And Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models, and much more with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying and selling and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description, and a very big thank you to all of my patrons. Your support is literally helping me to keep the lights on, so from the bottom of my little black heart, thank you all so very much. Support the channel by showing my executive producers some love, or sign up yourself today. And now, back to the video. Our story tonight begins, in a way, all the way back in the Old Country, which in this case is the Emerald Isle itself, Ireland. It was here that the circumstances which allowed for the McCreary family's brief dominance of organized crime in parts of Liberty were cultivated. When the as of yet unidentified patriarch of the McCreary clan moved to America, presumably, he would bring with him a legacy of violence and conflict, one that would dramatically characterize the early lives of both Gerald and his entire family. As we mentioned, Gerald McCreary was born the third child in 1973 to Maureen McCreary and the unidentified Mr. McCreary, being the younger brother to Derek and Francis, and older brother to Patrick and Kate. Jerry, as he would become known, would be raised presumably in Meadows Park, Northern Dukes, Liberty City, and from a very young age he would be exposed to just how his family made their living during a time when the family was arguably at the height of their power. Despite the power and influence the McCreary's had, Mr. McCreary would still find his own existence miserable enough to spread it as far and as devastatingly as he could, most notably by reportedly beating and even sexually abusing his children, most prominently, Jerry. This, combined with a lingering discrimination against the Irish, which was still fading as Jerry was growing up, would drive him into a life of crime and rebellion at an incredibly young age, being arrested for grand larceny when he was only 13 years old. 
Also, although it isn't known exactly when he began, Jerry would pick up alcohol very early in his life as well, likely as a means of coping with the abuse and isolation he received from his father and older brothers, and from being the often overlooked middle child in the family. Eventually, though, Mr. McCreary would die when Jerry and his brothers were still young men, and sometime soon after, Jerry's older brother Francis and Derek would also both step away from the family business, with Francis joining the LCPD and Derek moving back to Ireland for a time, leaving Jerry the oldest male and thereby the de facto leader of the McCreary crime family. By this time, however, the McCreary's had already seen their golden age come and go. According to all four McCreary brothers and our own investigations, there was indeed a time when the McCreary's were among the most feared and respected criminal outfits in the city. But by the time of Jerry's takeover, that time had long since passed, and the once powerful Irish mob was forced to play second fiddle, or even third fiddle, to one of the city's least respected mafia families, the Pegarinos. It isn't entirely clear when exactly Gerald formed his alliance with Jimmy Pegorino through Pegorino's capo, Ray Bacino, but we know that by 2008 they had been working together for some time, and it would be during the course of that year that their alliance would be tested by a series of unfortunate events, set in motion by Jerry himself. Also by 2008, Jerry, now a grown man, would reportedly have been married at least three times, and subsequently divorced three times as well. It's speculation on our part, but it seems fair to assume that a large part of the reason why may have been due to Gerald's, by that point, toxic alcoholism, which saw the already violent and short-tempered man become belligerent and actively violent, perhaps even to his significant others. Whatever the reasons, by mid-2008 he was back to being single, and as far as we are aware was singularly focused on trying to raise his family from the ashes of obscurity and make as much money doing it as he possibly could. would continue to offer his family's services to the Pegorinos through Ray Bacino, but eventually, in 2008, his younger brother, Patrick Packy McCreary, would befriend an invaluable asset. Through one of the family's drug contacts, Elisabetta Torres, Packy would be introduced to Nico Bellic, a Serbian freelancer who had recently arrived in Liberty City and was looking to make a name for himself and, more importantly, a bunch of money. After working together a few times, Nico and Packy would become close enough friends for Patrick to offer him a chance to see how the Irish mob used to do things back in the day, with one of the most widely publicized bank robberies of the decade, the Bank of Liberty Raid. There he is, Nico Bellic. Nico, these are my two brothers. Well, two of my brothers, the two that count. Derek and Gerald. Hi. Derek has just returned to the family fold after a good few years in the old country, involved in the struggle. Sort of like you, I'd imagine. And Jerry? Jerry's the man. And you remember Michael, St. Michael? <laughs> yes, yes, it's uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Nico's a trip, man. I met him through that Puerto Rican coke dealer. So you want to involve him in family business? What do you know about him? What I know is he likes a fight and he ain't the fucking law. Oh. No offense, mister? That ain't good enough. Well, it's good enough for me. He's a good lad, Jerry. Uh, was I talking to you in bread halfwit? <coughs> I make a point of not talking to the unfortunate victims of brother-sister marriage. Don't you speak about my parents like that. Oh, you're like fucking Cleopatra. Fifteen generations of brother-sisters fucking, and you're so thick you take orders off my idiot brother Packy. Who's so stupid, he had to tattoo his name on his arm. If there is a problem, I'll go. No trouble. I have other ways of making money. There's no problem. Jerry yeah. just likes to think he knows best about everything, which is why he's been married three times already and still won't admit he likes men. <laughs> <laughs> ah, no problem. I'll leave you boys to it. Don't screw up. Packy, take care of Derek. He's been away. And you? Nothing personal, but don't fuck with my family or I will fuck with yours. Gerald, though not actually planning to participate himself, would presumably be the mastermind behind this plot, along with his older brother Derek, who had only recently returned from Ireland. Derek, Patrick, St. Michael Keane, and Nico Bellic would all assault the bank armed with heavy assault rifles, and thanks to Nico's incredible skills as a gunman, 
the group would actually manage to escape the bank while being weighed down by several hundred thousand dollars in cash, and being pursued by practically every police officer in Liberty, and probably Alderney, states. After the bank job, Gerald would be more than satisfied with Nico's performance in helping his brothers to make it up with both their lives and the money, despite the unfortunate loss of Michael Keane along the way. Knowing that Nico needed money and still obligated by his own alliances to help Ray Bacino and the Pegarino family, Gerald would personally hire Nico to disrupt and antagonize the weakest of Liberty City's five families in order to hopefully, eventually, eliminate them so that Jimmy P could take their place. The family in question was the Ancelotti's, and Gerald's first major task for Nico involved staging a false flag attack on them by having Nico first pose as a member of their hired Albanian muscle. No one's here. Just you and me. Come in, come in. Beer? No, thank you. Oh, I agree. Let's have whiskey instead. Packy swears by you. Absolutely swears by you. Yeah? <sighs> you handled yourself well on the bank job. It was fun. Fun? Too much fun. That's always been this family's problem. Fun, good causes, a good laugh, some stupid dream or some stupid distraction. <laughs> but never any fucking focus. Never. Hmm, focus. <sighs> All we've ever been is bitches working for guineas, working for niggers, any asshole with a buck. A whole lot spent in a proper manner. Oh yeah, wine and women as quick as possible and remain a slave forever. Very poetical. Yeah, I know. National tragedy. But I got a plan. You down, friend? Maybe. What is it? Well, first up, we gotta create a little problem between the Ancelotti's and their Albanian muscle for Jimmy P. You're gonna plant a bomb in Tony Black's car. Be rigged to a phone. Thing will go off when you dial a number. I want it to blow when they get back from their meeting. So the Ancelotti's think the Albanians did it. <laughs> exactly. Bombs in an alley off of Inchin Avenue. Get it? Give me a call. You know, Packy was right for once. I'm glad you're on board. <sighs> Since the Ancelotti's had been known to work with the Albanians, Jerry and Nico would use that casual racism to their advantage by having Nico follow Ancelotti capo Anthony Tony Black Spoleto from Drusilla's restaurant in Little Italy to an old factory in North Holland after planting a bomb underneath Spoleto's vehicle, an expensive Cognoscenti sedan. The father. I had to do everything on my own. I didn't sleep for six months. You're a terrible mother. I can tell you listening to you. I love my son. When I met her, I was 24. She said she was 23, but she was really 13. I didn't. I told you I was 13. Well, it sounded like. You told me it was okay because you were from South Weasel South. News. Weasel News brought to you by Big Log Cereal. Who doesn't love Big Logs in the morning? A fiery explosion in Northwood. Police are concerned that terrorism is the cause of a huge explosion at a fuel depot in Northwood earlier. All of the casualties were known associates of the Ancelotti crime family, including senior capo Anthony Tony Black Spoleto. However, police are convinced this is not another example of organized crime running out of control and have requested additional anti-terror funds from Congress. In addition to our radio coverage, Weasel also ran an exclusive piece in its print edition following the assassination of Spoleto. Quote, Despite our repeated warnings, terrorists have attacked Liberty City again. This time the target was a fueling depot in Northwood. Some liberal news outfits are trying to spin this into a story about the Mafia. They're saying that the explosion was related to organized crime rather than terror. These leftist loons are crazy. They'll say and do anything before they admit that terrorism is the number one problem facing the nation, and much more important than any of their other pet projects, the environment, healthcare, and ludicrous foreign welfare projects. Witnesses saw a foreign-looking man walking away from the warehouse. What more evidence does the president need before the borders are shut to American-hating immigrants? Even more alarming, the LCPD forensics team has found a triggering device at the scene, which may have been activated by a cell phone. It is more than likely that this was just the first of many planned bombings. If you see a foreigner using a cell phone, he is probably a terrorist. Act first, ask questions later. You have the safety of your fellow Americans to consider, as well as your own.
In fact, this first in a series of incidents which characterized the brief war between the Ancelotti and Pegorino crime families was also reported on by one of our main competitors, and we are proud to read directly from their archive without paying a cent of royalties to them. Quote, Noose representatives are blaming terrorists for a massive explosion at a fueling depot in Northwood earlier. However, not everyone is convinced. Having been criticized for their failure to tackle the rise in organized crime, some say this may be an attempt to divert attention. Those killed in the blast were known associates of the Ancelotti crime family, and the warehouse itself was owned by Anthony Tony Black Spoleto, a senior Ancelotti capo, also killed in the attack. While the target's mob links may just be a coincidence, sources close to the Liberty Tree suggest it is much more likely that Tony Black was hit because he acted as a conduit between the Ancelottis and the Albanian street gang they use as muscle. Either the street gang wanted to be taken more seriously and eliminated their employer, or another mafia family decided to take out the competition. Terrorists aren't known for sticking around long enough to give their victims two in the back of the head, are they? Whether hitmen or terrorists blew up the warehouse, residents of Liberty City can be sure of one thing. This city is not safe. Following the death of Tony Black, Gerald would only continue to use Nico's unique skill set to further cripple the Ancelottis when planning the assassination of yet another Ancelotti capo, this time Frank Garone. Gerald would personally find, kidnap, and murder an unidentified Albanian gangster and have Nico don the dead man's clothes to once again pose as an Albanian gone rogue and further divide the Ancelottis from their hired muscle so that the Pegorinos could come in for the kill, presumably, eventually. <laughs> Nico! You made it, huh? <sighs> well, I'll leave you to your men's talk. I hope you impress each other. Hey, look at me. Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. You'll do fine. Fine at what? Some gimp work for the Pegorinos. I owed them. Oh, please. I do it myself, but I think I'm being watched by the cops. Someone. I think I'm about to get pinched again. Shit, really? Yeah, it's happened before. I keep seeing the same car watching. All it means is someone's been speaking, we just have to find out who and make them stop. In the meantime, it chill things out for a bit. So, I need your help. Okay. boy. Come on, I got something to show you. Now, Pegorino's a funny guy. Seems like his main motivation is putting his Guernsey crew on par with the five old families. Ancelotti's being the weakest, he's decided to stir shit up for him. Now the Ancelotti's have an uneasy alliance with some Albanians. They use them as hitmen, thugs, bullies. I know the type. Much like Jimmy the Guido uses us. So, what you're gonna do is disguise yourself as an Albanian and then go whack Frankie Garone, an Ancelotti longtime capo. Sure. Which Albanian? Uh, this one. Nico would indeed locate Garone, already in a conflict with one of the actual Albanians who are now under suspicion of being traitors following the murder of Tony Black. After a protracted chase across parts of Algonquin on motorbike, Nico would once again successfully carry out his mission and murder Frank Garone while disguised as an Albanian, which would only further increase the tensions between them and the Ancelotti's, exactly what Jerry wanted. However, despite his caution by this time, which increasingly saw Jerry using his younger brother Packy to get the dirty work done, sometime in 2008 he would still manage to get arrested under racketeering charges, and the middle McCreary would be imprisoned at the Alderney State Correctional Facility for an undefined amount of time. Whilst inside, one might think that Jerry's criminal aspirations would die, however anyone who thought so had clearly never met one of the McCreary's before. Using coded messages, contacts on the inside, and his established reputation among Liberty and Alderney State's most cutthroat criminals, many of which were already incarcerated alongside him, Jerry would continue to pass along orders for the family to Packy, and even continue to hire Nico Bellic directly, as he planned his next big move against the Ancelotti's, which he hoped would both ruin them for good and score his crew a lucrative payday, perhaps even enough to help him put up a legal battle to escape his incarceration. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm sorry about your brother. Hey, uh, me and Francis were never exactly close, but he was my brother, and it hurts. Poor bastard. 
past. He believed in something once. That's a hell of a lot better than me, I guess. <laughs> Fuck, I'll miss him. How are you? In here? Fine. Time of my life. Goddamn time of my life. What you up for? Oh, a lot of things. Racketeer and armed robbery. A bunch of shit I never did, because I was always a well-behaved family man who occasionally liked to drink, but nothing more. Of course. Like us all. Like us all. But the thing is, I think I should make some changes in my life. Stop with the drink. Put it down. Stop hanging out with the wrong sort. Can you help me do that? It is a final chance at redemption. Look, whatever you want, I will do my best to help. Good. Give Packy a call. He'll explain what, uh, I need guidance with the most. The areas where I have strayed furthest from the path. See ya. Following the death of either his older brother Derek or Francis, it isn't entirely clear which one was actually killed, Jerry would orchestrate a kidnapping plot centered on the daughter of the Ancelotti family boss, Giovanni Ancelotti, and he would hire Nico to make sure things went as planned. Nico would pose as a prospective buyer for Gracie Ancelotti's old pink Feltzer sports car, and arrive to test drive the vehicle with Gracie riding shotgun. Halfway through the supposed test drive, however, Nico would make a detour, incapacitating Gracie and delivering her to a McCreary family safe house on Franklin Street in Leftwood, Alderney, for safekeeping until an exchange could be agreed upon with her powerful father. Though a hefty transaction for the safe return of his daughter was ostensibly the plan, Nico and the McCreary's would more directly be simply continuing their harassment and disruption of Ancelotti affairs on behalf of Jimmy P and the eventual deal that would be agreed upon would simply be an added bonus to the Irish mobsters, whose leader was already behind bars. Before the exchange could be established, however, the Ancelotti's would attempt to find and take Gracie back by force, something the McCreary's and Nico fully anticipated, with plans to move Gracie to a second safe house should the Ancelotti's discover her location, which is exactly what happened. Nico would once again meet with Jerry at the Alderney State Correctional Facility and be instructed in coded language on how to deal with the developing situation, with Nico continuing to work with Jerry's brother Patrick, who remained on the outside. Hey. Hey. Yeah, so uh, anyway, a friend of mine in here tells me that a close friend of yours, who you've been spending a lot of time with recently, swept the clean off her feet, Okay. Yeah, her old boyfriend wants her back. They always do. Desperately and quickly, and he's looking for her. I think you and her should go out on a glamorous date in Algonquin. Show her a new pad. Then, things would be okay between you two. But move your fucking ass, pal. Women don't like a chump, you get me? Despite the attempts by the Ancelotti's to find and free Gracie, Nico would successfully manage to move her without incident, and eventually an uneasy agreement would finally be reached between the McCreary's and the Ancelotti's to exchange Gracie for a handful of incredibly valuable diamonds, which had changed hands already several times since arriving in Liberty City on the very same boat as Nico. Hey. wrong? There's good news and there's bad news. Good news is, everything's coming together. Bad news? Ain't gonna make a blind bit of difference to me. Uh, what do you mean? Do you want me to spell it out? No, I guess not. Thanks. Back, you'll give you a call and explain. The ex-boyfriend of your girl is gonna agree to the divorce terms. Unfortunately, turns out he wasn't our only problem. Some other crap has turned up. I don't think I'll be getting out anytime soon. Been a great laugh. You look after yourself. Yeah. Nico and Packy would meet with the Ancelotti contacts Luis Lopez and Anthony Gay Tony Prince at the Sewage Works on Charge Island, but to everyone's surprise, the meeting would erupt into chaos, not because of either party attempting to back down from the deal, but due to the arrival of one of Nico Bellic's oldest rivals and the original owner of the Diamonds, Ray Bulgarian. 
After everything was said and done, the diamonds would be lost, Gracie would be returned, mostly, unharmed to the Ancelotti family, and Gerald McCreary would learn that even if the exchange had gone as planned, he would likely still be trapped in prison for a substantial part of his adult life, possibly even the rest of his life. He would pay Nico one last time for his services to his family, despite the outcome of the diamond fiasco, and resign himself to the inevitability of life in prison for the next 10 to 15 years asking Nico to keep an eye on his family and take care of them while he remained inside, showing just how much Jerry had come to trust Nico by that point. Given that this was all in 2008, it is actually entirely possible that this year, in 2023, Gerald McCreary could finally be seeing release for his original prison sentence, assuming he did not receive additional years for any bad behavior whilst inside. Should you be walking down the streets of Meadows Park any time in the near future, be sure to keep an eye out for one of Liberty City's most notorious criminal gangsters, who might just be walking down the streets today, a free man. Gerald McCreary was a short-tempered, alcoholic, and privately violent man, at least by the time he took control of the family's criminal operations. As a young man, he was surrounded by violence, abuse, and heavy drug use, and his family's role in the city's criminal underground would prove far more alluring to Jerry than the prospect of fighting for justice, as his older brother Francis would purport to be interested in. Jerry was a stereotypically macho-type brawler, being of a larger-than-average frame and being no stranger to using his size and personality to intimidate others. He valued loyalty and honesty, but may have struggled to reciprocate those values in all aspects of his life given his apparent three failed marriages and his well-known tendency to abuse alcohol. Though in the past we have attempted to compile a list of all possible crimes committed by the subjects we examine here on this program, our legal team has advised us that, especially with the possible release of Mr. McCreary, it would be best to stick to what crimes we do know he committed, which for Jerry, as we mentioned earlier, began at the very young age. In 1986, at the ripe old age of 13, Jerry would be arrested for grand larceny, though it isn't entirely clear what he stole, and surprisingly, for the next four years, he would manage to avoid further trouble with the LCPD, at least being caught by them. In 1990, however, at age 17, Jerry would once again be arrested, this time for assault, and just two years later he would be charged with armed robbery and hijacking, for which he may have done time, though we could not confirm that to be the case. By this time, it is believed, though not confirmed, that Mr. McCreary Sr. was still actively running the family's day-to-day -day criminal operations, but we also believe that by 1999, seven years later, Mr. McCreary had died and Gerald, at the age of 26, would be forced to take his place with his older brother Francis, now working for the LCPD, and Derek returning to the old country. That year, he would also be charged once again, this time for conspiracy to commit extortion, which we believe to be further evidence that by this time, Jerry was no longer serving as a mere foot soldier, but was actively calling the shots. He would also be arrested one more time in 2005 before his 2008 incarceration, this time, for all things, tampering with sports contests, dog racing, though he would not see any jail time over the next three years. The LCPD, possibly with the direct help from the Deputy Police Commissioner and Jerry's older brother, Francis McCreary, would work to pin charges on Jerry that would actually stick, and by 2008 they would do just that, by hitting him with several racketeering charges, for which he was finally put in prison. What leads a man to a life of violence and kidnapping plots? Is it the abuse and mistreatment so prevalent throughout this nation? Is it the allure of the American dream in the hope of living the way the other half lives? Or is it perhaps a malignant madness that infects the most susceptible among us? We may never know, but one thing I do know is that America is a dangerous place. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that ginger grocery store clerk is secretly working for the Irish mob and planning to rob the bank the next time you need a few extra bucks to spend at the Triangle Club. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you so much for watching.